everybody. Welcome to, what is this called? J&J &J on Jazz, powered by Jazzwire? Thank you. Yeah, I, I just spaced out a little bit about where we were, and I'm not used to sitting beside you, so... Uh, do you ever change clothes? I've been wearing this for six weeks now. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> Jazzwire Black. It's slimming. It, um, black is great. It really oh works. Oh, man. Yeah, it's... Wesleyan's a Nike-branded school here, too, so I mean, I'm just trying to represent... Wow. Can I get a Nike Jazzwire thing, or...? I don't... That's Probably. above my pay grade. Wait All right. Minute. All right. Well, uh, I think we've started uh, clearly, so <laughs> let's uh, let's just keep going. So uh, we have had so many questions uh, from you folks over the course of a year on YouTube and certainly inside Jazzwire. So we want to get to four questions today. We've had about fifty fantastic questions we've been collecting. We're going to do this more often, but I want to jump in. So we're each going to uh, answer two questions. So one of the questions we got, and, and these are questions we've received numerous times from numerous people, are the, the turnaround, the tag turnaround, a three, six, two, five progression. So strategies or language or approaches for playing over a turnaround. Sometimes we have a turnaround that happens over and over again as sort of an ending to a song, but lots of songs are built on that right. turnaround. Right. It's a real functional skill to be able to play over this kind of a chord progression. Because you're right, Jeff, they exist in tunes. We use them at the end of tunes to extend a tune. Matter of fact, think of some of the great Miles recordings of standards, or, uh, and I, I know Coltrane borrowed this from Miles, oh, yeah. where the turnaround would become its own tune. It's longer than the tune. Absolutely, right. Yeah. My, my first rule is let the changes guide you. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Just let the changes guide you. So I always tell students, start by playing ideas that outline the changes. Well, you know what? Let's jump into the playing, right? And that's the thing that I'm gonna do first off is just really try to play ideas that I can move down in whole steps. I think that's important. To I do. like that. So the idea of the three six and then the two five is the same sort of architecture moving down a whole step. Just be real blatant about it. It cool. worked for Grant Green. We don't have to do anything different than that. I like it. That sounded fantastic. Uh, one thing I was aware of, and I, I'm not sure if James was thinking this way, he sort of hinted that he was, but I was hearing lots of two measure phrases and then the next thing. So it was, you know, there was a call and response aspect. I'm not yeah. sure if he was thinking about it that way. Um, but here's two measures and here's two measures. Sometimes it was this thing and played at the next pitch level. Sometimes it was an answer, but it was literally, here's a sentence. And here's a sentence. Part of that is because the, the time field that we've got going on that playback was in two, right? Right. So when something, when a turnaround or a tag is in two, I find that it makes me play a lot of short ideas, mm. right? I don't play a lot of lines when the got time it. field is in two. Um, but again, the idea is to let the changes really guide you. And, and I, I never feel like I should be trying to reinvent the wheel over an extended tag 
um, like a 3625 or a 2536, because you can flip it around and do it both ways, mm -hmm. right? But play simple melodies, move them around in whole steps, I think in two bar chunks. Keep it simple. I right? like it. it. That's great advice. And there's so much to be done there. And obviously, James is playing at a super high level. Mm -hmm. So that is not dumbed down advice, right? Like every once in a while, it's easy to hear advice and think, well, yeah, okay, that's, you know, that's the basic stuff. Give me the real stuff. That's the real stuff. Or that's all I'm capable of. One of the two. Either way, it's the real stuff. So by the way, <laughs> James just showed me on his phone, one of his buddies sent him a program from what year? 2015. 2015. September of 2015. September 2015. It's a program from the Pittsburgh Symphony, and it lists Phil Woods, and then it lists James Moore. It was Phil Woods' last performance on planet Earth before he died, and uh, it was uh, James got to play that gig on stage standing beside Phil Wood. So that's uh, yeah. that's kind of amazing, man. You mind? Yeah, go ahead. Bing! It was pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> it was pretty wow. wild. One of my heroes, Phil Woods. Okay, so another question we had was about warming up. And, you know, mm. so, so like the goals of warming up, what's the point? You know, what do we do to reach our goals? So, wow, there's so many ways to go. There's so many different warm ups that I have or that I've had over the years cycling through. Um, and so a couple ways to think about it. Um, one is getting ready, you know, the mechanics of our instrument. How do you warm up on the piano, right? How do you warm up on the trumpet? Is it the Arben's exercises? Is it, is it, you know, is it lip slurs? Is it, you know, there's all those things to do on the instrument. So on a horn, generally some sort of long tones, on a saxophone, harmonics, those sort of things to get our air going. So there's the instrument to contend with. Mm. Then I think there's finger stuff to contend with is like, let me get fluid. So today in our Jazzwire virtual happy hour, we had people from all around the world, which was a blast from the UK and Australia and Germany and Canada and the States. It was so much fun. And somebody brought up Ted Dunbar, the great uh, guitar player who I got to study with very quickly. He founded the jazz department at Rutgers or co-founded it. And um, so his warm up was playing these 20 or 30 bebop heads every day for decades. Wow. Play Donna Lee every day. Don't solo over it, just play the melody. Just play the line. Play Joy Spring every day. Play Room 608 by Horace Silver every day. Uh. Play Billy's Bounce every day. And so Ted, Bar Ted Dunbar did that. And that warm up was a finger warm up, but he was an ear and brain warm up. He was hearing the greatest language ever written or played and he was making his instrument do it so at the end of playing those 20 or 30 melodies which took what 15 minutes he was ready to go so okay so that's the second thing so we talked about warming up uh, how we make sound on our instrument then there's the finger thing to me making music and that's the hard one. That's one that gets overlooked because we can talk about the mechanics of the saxophone and long tones, and we can talk about wiggling our fingers well, mm. but creating music. So that's what jazz musicians do. So, and, and not to, you know, talk down to about classical musicians or anyone else, but our gig is to create on the spot. Yeah. So how do we warm ourselves up to create on the spot? That's not a finger exercise or a tone exercise. So that's a more interesting one and maybe a little more to the point. So um, what I'm a big fan of and what we talked about in the happy hour today was free playing. The idea of creating music out of nothing and just get used to doing that. And so there are things to talk about. There's ways to do it and ways to do it a little bit ineffectively, ways to do it more effectively. So that's something I'm working with people inside Jazzwire a lot on. But... Um, Think about that with your warm up. Um, warming up isn't just managing the tool. Warming up is you're the tool or mm. you're the conduit to create music. And how do we warm that up? Yeah. So I'll leave that as a bit of an open question, but I'm going to say free playing is great. And not free playing in the way to go out and get gigs as a free player. I do free playing so that I can play the blues and confirmation better. Yeah, dig it. Dig cool. it. Dig it.
That's great. Yeah. All right. That. So we have another question. Um, a number of people were asking about rhythmic variety. How do we get rhythm into our playing? What do you think about it's that? It's interesting that they've asked that question and you asked the guy that plays way too many eighth notes to answer that question, <laughs> right? I literally have a hockey jersey that says eighth note king on the back of it. <laughs> that is true. How to add more rhythmic variety to solos. Just do it. <laughs> no. Okay. Well, Sponsored by Nike. Sponsored by Nike. Uh, um, for me, it means breaking up those eighth note lines. I love playing eighth note lines. And for some of you out there, that may be something you're working on, right? Developing mm -hmm. the ability to play those long lines. I, and Jeff and I both like to play long lines. You get to a point where you can spin those long lines out of your instrument, you don't want to stop. Yeah. There's something real satisfying about that. Yeah. So what I find myself having to do is literally take the horn off my face sometimes and think about playing off beats. For yeah. me, that's how I break up that monotony. Cool. Um, I don't practice that very much, but I find myself on gigs recognizing, because I'm trying to keep myself open and in the moment, but at present at the same time, I start recognizing when I'm running off at the mouth, so to speak, and playing too many eighth notes. And the other thing that I really key in on is the drummer's left hand, right? Okay. And so I don't ever want to mimic or Mickey Mouse what the drummer's doing with his comping in his left hand for me. But if I feel like I'm, I'm playing lines that are just starting to become too eighth note centric, if I key in on the drummer's left hand and just let that kind of inspire me, I find that I'm playing ideas that are more rhythmically interesting. The other thing that I like to do, um, and we might not think of it as being rhythmic variety, because it's not uh, a small increment rhythm, play longer notes, man. Uh-huh. Right? I mean, just like, don't be afraid to hold a note for a couple of beats and really let right. something sing. Well, that's interesting, because I mean, holding a note for two beats, three beats, that literally breaks up the rhythm. So we, we're, you know, probably a lot of us are thinking about what's a cool Afro-Cuban cascara rhythm that we can invert to, right? right? <laughs> Some sort of superimposition, right? Right, that we can come up with some crazy quantum jazz rhythm. Why don't you but just play a damn whole note? There you go, right? <laughs> like, that's pretty brilliant. And um, and the idea of listening to a drummer's left hand. So where is a drummer's left hand? It's on the left side of their body, at the end of their arm. And what drum is there? That's the snare drum. And then they, you know, so typically the snare drum, and then it could be the hi-hat and around there. Yeah. That's really smart, because that's one of the main comping places that a drummer uses. So when you listen to the language and it's, you know, of course, since it's the snare drum, it's very sort of pointillistic, mm -hmm. rhythmic stuff, right? Wow, what a great answer. That's well, uh, And I want to give a quick shout out real quick to some friends of mine who are also doing some really fun podcasts. My friend Mike Dawson in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with Drum Factory Direct. And he's got a series with a couple Pittsburgh drummers, Tom Went and Dave Throckmorton, and they just did an awesome episode on 10 Reasons to Love Art Blakey. Oh, wow. Three of the greatest drummers I know sitting around a table talking about Art Blakey, and it got me thinking about how much I needed to get back into listening to the parts of Art's playing that are technically, like the, the drum technique part of it, mm. right? And it got me thinking about the tone of his snare drum and the kinds of rhythms he's playing in his left hand. So for you horn players out there, or even you comping instruments out there, can you sing some real typical Art Blakey comping rhythms that he uses in his left hand, wow. right? Really get inside of these different drummers because the, the snare drum is the center of the comping world for the drummer, right? Right. Add more rhythmic variety. I mean, wow. That's, yeah, there's no better, uh, wow, no better advice. That's fantastic. And I need to uh, get with those guys. That's fantastic. I yeah. need to, uh, yeah, meet those folks for sure. So let's get to one last question. And this was uh, somebody asking about composing our own melodies or etudes or contrafacts. And contrafact is a fancy word that I only learned a couple of years ago, which means a melody written over existing chord changes. Yeah. So like a blues, tenor madness. Every blues ever written is a contrafact, except for the very first blues ever written, right? Like, so all, you know, rhythm changes songs, anthropology or rhythming or Lester Leaps In, contrafacts. Right? You could take take the A train, that form, those changes, write your own melody over it. So as jazz teachers, as pedagogists, pedag is that pedagogues. A word? Pedagogues. Pedagogues. I like I thought I think my word had more syllables, which means it's 
And it, it sounds less like demagogue, which yeah. is what a pedagogue sounds like. Let's go with his. <laughs> so it's a great way to teach ideas, right? So uh, I think it's a very valuable thing for you to do is to write a solo. And it's a really cool thing. So write a solo and post it on Jazzwire. Bring it into Jazzwire. And the cool thing is I can look at that and see where your sweet spots are. Ah, she understands this. She's nailing that. Or oh, I can see he's not quite getting the concept of that. It's a really, really great window into what's going on because it's very honest. You're writing everything you know, and you have an eraser, right? So you're able to go back and change it. And so you're sort of putting forward the best thing that you could kind of do. And uh, there's so much to be learned from it. So I'm actually going to play something for you that I haven't played in about three years. But um, I remember going back to uh, one of my previous series, the Digging Deeper Jazz series. I think it was episode 40. Um, I had done four videos talking about enclosures. And so, um, so it was out of context of a lot of things. And so I, I really wanted to put it in context. So, hey, here's the song Summertime. And I wanted to write an etude that just had a boatload of enclosures and how I might use them. So the approach, so I had a goal when I wrote this thing is, can I use a bunch of enclosures? I, you know, and after I wrote it, it was like, well, I, but I didn't, I wanted it to sound like music a little bit, like not too much like an etude. So it, it was an interesting thing to do. So I picked the song. First of all, what is the, the song or the set of chord changes? It could have been anything. I picked Summertime. Do I have a goal? You don't have to have a goal for your solo, but I had a goal. Let me do enclosures. And I, Jeff, personally learned a lot writing that etude because I sort of, would run into problems or, well, my line left me here and I want to do an A2 or I want to do uh, an enclosure, but the enclosure I know is here, but I have to do an enclosure up here. And how would I do that? So I had to think myself out of some problems. And mm. that's why we write those etudes right, is right. we run into problems and we have to think our way out of the problem. So I think it's a really great way to go. So let me uh, play this thing for you. And we have this PDF for you this week. So uh, check this one out. So I think I got a lot of those notes in the right order. And there's stuff there that I really want to get into my playing. I need to go back to that and, uh, you know, get some of that cool enclosure stuff. So that's, I, I remember learning a lot doing that process. And now that I come back to it, I can see things that I want to get inside my playing. So that idea of writing an etude, a contrafact, that's not a, that's not a song that I would put a title on. It's an etude that's you know, really working to death in closure. Yeah, you've put, your, you've put yourself in a place, um, a, a, not a real place, but you've put yourself in a metaphorical place that you're struggling with, right? And yep. trying to work out problems. I mean, it's problem solving, yep. right? I think some of the great bebop melodies that got written over those chord progressions, I think it was the same kind of thing. These cats were working out language, mm -hmm. they were working out concepts and ideas, and they came up with these great lines that were melodies. So... You're, what you're doing here is firmly within the tradition of the music, in my opinion. Cool. That's great. So, yeah. So, I'd be happy to send this to you if there's something here. I have it transposed into, you know, different keys, bass, clef, everything else. So, if that's helpful to you, that's great. But I love the question, and I think there's a lot of value for writing out an etude or a solo. Or, so how does an etude or a solo differ from a song? Well, I think that's, you know, a good conversation for another time. But I think you have a sense of... Uh, you know, what makes a solo versus a song. And I've had some fun actually recently. I've been doing some guest artist gigs around the country mm -hmm. and up in Canada. And a lot of the tunes I write are kind of hard and they need some rehearsal. Yeah. And so now I'm going to a town. We've got 15 minutes to talk through the set and now let's play. So I've been writing some contrafacts over some different, uh, over some different forms. You know, there'll never be another you or a blues tune or whatever. And that's been fun to try to write something that's compelling but easy for a pro to read and play. 
Yeah. It's not dumbed down. It's interesting, but so uh, so I've had fun doing that. So you know, on one of our next gigs, I'll bring some of that stuff. Please, in. I'd love to. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd awesome. be cool. Well, hey, thank you for the questions. This was really fun uh, getting to some of your questions. There's so many good ones out there. So keep the questions coming in. We're going to do more episodes like this for sure. And uh, I hope we're going to see you at uh, Jazzwire Summer Summit, the virtual session, July 15th through 17th, or the in-person session with us and a bunch of other fantastic musicians, July 20th through 23rd. Come check it out. It'll be a great hang. Take care.